And one of my closest friends, a girlfriend of mine, drove up from Orange County and then didn't show up at the show. And after the show, I, I called her and I was like, what happened to you? And she goes, I don't want you to be mad at me, but I was at the coffee bean and Denzel Washington was in there and I couldn't let myself leave. And I was like, you just sat and looked at him? Yeah, I didn't even talk to him. You're listening to Studio 22. Thank you guys so much for watching. We hope you enjoy the video. Please don't forget to leave a like. Subscribe and hit the bell for notifications for more future content. Welcome to Studio 22. I'm Brock O'Hearn. I'm here with my co-host, Will Meldman, and we are sitting with the one and only Brett Young. How's it going, man? Good. How you doing, bro? I, the one, I like the one and only thing. That's... Uh, yeah. It's not even true. Yeah. <laughs> there are I'm a sure lot of us. I'm sure there's a lot of Brett Youngs out there, right? <laughs> we were just sitting here with uh, Jim Nance and he was saying how many Brocks he knows. So that's a more rare one, but I can imagine the Brett Youngs out there. Uh, yeah. I, you might be the second Brock. Really? So you win. Cool. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and also, I don't know that they're using Brock on like for little girls yet, but Brett started becoming like a girl's name too. So I was, yeah. yeah. I know a couple I'm 41. Of I'm old enough. We're not dealing with that, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, a little that, different. That's funny. That is hilarious. Yeah. A little different. Definitely. A lot of wills out there too, right? And Williams, Williams, mm -hmm. Williams, <laughs> Willies for a girl. <laughs> Willies. Uh, Willa. Yeah. Yeah. Willow. I dated a Willow actually. And Willow and Willow. That would have been strange if it worked out. Back to your regular schedule. <laughs> Entertainment. <laughs> um, dude, I actually, uh, when I was, when I was, Checking out your stuff. Like, I mean, I've been a fan of your music for, for years now, um, but I noticed we're both from Orange County. Whereabouts? Yeah. Uh, I grew up in San Juan, mm -hmm. Dana Point. Yeah yeah. 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 I was, I was Huntington Beach, but then kept moving south and lived in like South Newport, like almost like the kind of Crystal Cove area before I moved to LA. So we, we, would, uh, we would go down that way pretty often. Yeah. Uh, Newport and uh, Huntington were my stomping grounds. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it, do you ever get nostalgic and, and, and then realize it's not the same as it used to be? And so you feel okay about things? Yeah. I yeah. just, uh, just had the conversation with uh, a friend of mine and they're saying how Huntington is just a different beast mm -hmm. now, a mm -hmm. different beast. And it, I saw the transition as I was moving out to LA, probably like, I don't know, eight, nine years ago, whatever it was. Uh, and yeah, it's not the same. And then also the, the homes and everything are getting incredible, uh, mm -hmm. beaches that I used to hop the fence to go surf are now, some of the biggest developments, you know, there. private communities yeah, and yeah. private beaches. And Good yeah, point. it's, it's okay. It's, it's what happens, but, uh, but it's just not the same. I don't miss it yeah. as much as I expected to. Yeah. Yeah. I feel the same. And even moving to LA too, I noticed a big change in, uh, Orange County would shut down at like 8 PM. And when you're growing up and, you know, turning 21 finally and trying to get out and have fun, you know, going to your local Applebee's is not the, not the answer. So that's, <laughs> yeah. In the South, it is. Yeah, well, that's yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's that's actually absolutely true. Um, yeah, you started off. Uh, you played baseball, right? And you played. Uh, yeah, my baseball. whole life, um, baseball was. Um, I was a three sport guy. I played baseball, basketball, and football. Um, I didn't give up football until uh, my sophomore year, only because I had the opportunity to play varsity basketball, and they overlapped. So I let football go. Um, I loved football and you know, I'm six, six and I was a pitcher. So I, I would have been like a stereotypical quarterback, but basketball was kind of my first love. Uh, and baseball was the thing I was the best at. So I had to kind of weigh what was what. And so, yeah, I, I it was always sports for me, um, but I went to a Christian school. So music was like most schools, the guys that play sports get the girls, but at my school, it was like the, the guys that played guitar and sang got the girls. So I was like, well, maybe I do both. I'll just do both, you know? And uh, yeah, so it was interesting the way that kind of panned out because I ended up getting asked to help lead worship, which meant sit in the back and play guitar. And, um, and that was while baseball was still the priority. This was just helping a dude out. And then uh, I did that one time and he said, I'm going to be out of town next week. You got to do it. And so now I'm a sophomore in high school, 700 people on a Friday morning. I got to play and sing. And I've never done that before. So uh, it didn't go well. <laughs> but the athlete in me loved the challenge. And uh, when he graduated that year, I got the gig and I, I did that um, every Friday morning for my junior and senior year while I was still playing two sports and, and, and that whole thing. So uh, I, it always still felt like a hobby, something you did at a Christian school. But 
because uh, sports always felt like the thing, but you don't foresee an injury like I had until it comes up. You know, you just yeah. kind of lean on the, you kind of lean on the prize as far as it'll let you, and then it, you bang your head into enough doors. Yeah, and you know, yeah. you stop banging. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes life hits you like that, right? So was that when you first got into music? It was more based on kind of church and in high school or college. Was that? Yeah, I mean, as a music fan. Um, I was always a big music fan. Uh, I would, you know, fall asleep at night to playing cassette tapes of like uh, boys to men records. And and I don't know if you remember an artist called Stevie B. This is probably, I'm dating myself right now, but um, Brian McKnight, things like that. Like that's because my parents brought me up on like Marvin Gaye and Otis Redding and stuff like that. So it was kind of like the newer version of that soul singer. Um so I was always a fan of music and I would listen to that all the time. But uh, as a performer, I thought of it as a hobby. But yeah, so, so on the performance side, it started in church for sure. I never thought like I'm listening to Brian McKnight sing One Last Cry and I'm going, I'll never do that. You know, like, there's no way I could do that. Um, but I can lead people in worship. But the thing about worship leading is you're not a performer at all. Your job is to actually be so invisible that they can come into the space on their own. If they're distracted by you, you haven't done your job very well. So my whole job was to be so vanilla and invisible that they could come into worship. Exact opposite of what I do now. (laughs) But that's where it started for sure. You kind of touched on a little bit, but your uh, background in sports helped you become the musician you are today and do what you do. Yeah, I think we're seeing a lot of this. Um, specifically in country music is the, like the work ethic thing. Um, you walk up and down Broadway right now in Nashville, every bar, it doesn't just have one stage. It has like three floors of stages with three different acts going on all the time. They all sound incredible. It's like that Jason Aldean song where he says, everybody plays, everybody sings. It's true. The party left out is everybody's great, mm-hmm. you know? And so what's the difference, you know? And I played bars and restaurants in LA for 10 years. Um, and I got here and I went, they're better than me. So what am I going to do better? I think, you know, I leaned on songwriting for the longest time. I came here to actually write for other people. Um, I just ended up getting a record deal because of it. But then now you have a record deal. What are you going to do different? And that's where sports came in. It was like, well, I'm going to do more things and work harder. And I think that serves everybody in life. I think that's why athletes continue to be successful throughout their life, even after sports. You know, whether they choose to go into broadcasting or coaching or whatever they do, they just can't shut it down. They want to keep working, keep putting in the effort and outworking the person next to them because there's a competitive aspect to it. And so I think that's what it lended itself to me. Yeah, it's definitely a little secret sauce and, you know, making the dream come true through hard work. Yeah. That's one of the reasons I moved to LA in the first place. I kept having people come up and saying, you should do this, you should do that, you know, my cousin's a manager or this person's that you should start acting and i'm like all right cool i'm waiting for someone to come in and hand me that golden ticket never happened so i said i was 19 i'm like i'm moving to la screw it and if i work hard I make the dream come true mm-hmm. so it's been a grind and it's a lot of fun but grateful every step of the way you know that's it that's exactly yeah. it you got to be I, we were sitting i had a songwriting session this morning we uh sometimes it takes a long time sometimes it happens fast this today happened fast those are the best days because you end up kind of taking breaks in between. You, like, we just nailed that part. We got that. That's the lyric. Write it down. Let's sing it. And then sit down and take a deep breath because you're not in a hurry anymore, you know? And so we were just talking about life. And, you know, we don't all write with the same people. So I hadn't seen some of them in a while. And so we were just, like, chopping it up. And I stopped them. I said, do you guys ever think about how, like, how lucky we are that this is a work day? We just took a 30-minute break to chop it up, talk about nothing we're still going to be in and out in four hours with a song that we're proud of that people are going to enjoy. You ever think about like how lucky you are? And uh, I think that continuing to remind yourself of that is really important, regardless of how you like some people, like you said, the golden ticket, some people, they they do get the golden ticket. Yeah. TikTok's doing that for a lot of people right now. (laughs) Here you go. You're brand new. We like your voice. Wait, a million people watched your video. Let's check it out. Yeah. And there are other people that are like, yeah, 15 years in the bars. Doesn't matter. Once you get the opportunity, you better show You up. better dig in and do it. Yeah. Absolutely. I've, I've heard a lot of people, musicians specifically, that uh, they say TikTok is the biggest mover for their music and, and getting them 
you know, downloads, listens, notoriety. If your song goes viral there, it's uh it's like hitting a massive single, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. It's a, it is it is the one of the one of if not the biggest platform right now outside of actual streaming and 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 terrestrial radio. Yeah. Have, has it changed uh the way you approach music? No, I can't let it. Can't let it. I don't think it I, I think of it kind of in, you know, for better or for worse. Um, I think of it kind of like a um these singing competitions too that are making judges famous, but very few artists famous. You know, I think it's uh you know, it, it's not, this is not a blanket statement because I have a song out with a girl called Ashley Cook right now that she wrote. She sounds incredible. I was a fan of the song. When they asked me, it was an absolute yes. I think she's a monster. I think she's going to be fantastic. This isn't a blanket statement. She got her big break through TikTok, so it's not a blanket statement. But I do think that those 10 years in the bars are valuable to people Yeah, because you get the reps, and then when you finally get the opportunity, you have the endurance to actually like get through those hard weekends or those hard months or whatever it is. Um, and I think there's a reason for that. I think there's, so I think it's kind of, it's kind of giving people opportunities before they're prepared sometimes. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty cool. Yeah. We see it a lot in, uh, I feel like you watch the transition of how, you know, coming up as an artist, whether that is music or film and TV or whatever the space may be of how there's an old school way of doing it that worked, you know, 10, 20, 30 mm -hmm. years ago. And now it's, okay, well, now we're in a new age, there's new tools available. Um, how do we adapt and do it? Or do you stay true to, that's my biggest thing, is I think if you stay true to yourself, uh, it kind of unfolds itself, but also being open to, you know, trying things out, like you doing a song with a, someone who started on TikTok is, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a big transition, right? Yeah, yeah, well, you have to, I think that the whole thing is you have to be able to identify talent, like, apart from your bias, right? Like, I, I can have my opinions about TikTok. It doesn't mean that, like I shouldn't have listened to an Ashley Cook song that was sent to me. Of course I listened. You have to be able to listen objectively and not go like, no, I have these opinions. Like that's, I'm very hard headed in black and white, but not so much that I'll miss a good song or a good opportunity. She's fantastic. The song's really good. That has nothing to like TikTok was how she got here, but it wasn't why she got here. You know, she got here cause she's been doing this for a long time and she's ready for it. Um, I guess my thing is just, it probably selfishly like, you know, I, I had to do the hustle. Everybody should have to go through the hustle. You know, if you're, if you're never hungry, you've never wanted it enough is what Gavin DeGraw said to me one time. And I was like, I don't know what you mean. And then, and then I played bars and restaurants for 10 years and then got my record deal. And I was like, Hey, I can look back and know exactly what you meant when you said that. Yeah. So. We, I mean, we talk about that a lot for sure is, you know, not only manifesting your dreams and your passions, but also like, you know, all the years I was a, production assistant on sets i mean it was almost a decade i you know would work these long hours and grind it out but it's as you know it's a sacrifice for your future goals and what you want to do so you can pretty much do almost anything if you know in your head you're doing it for the right reasons and you know for the right goals mm -hmm. for sure I, it's for me that you know your agenda always changes and anybody that says they don't have an agenda is lying you have some sort of agenda whether it's self-serving or, or, or whatever, or money or whatever it is. Um, but when it, when it changed to family for me is when everything got real. It was like, I will not be outworked. Uh, my, fam Great. my family will be taken care of. Like, there's no way there, there, we only say no, if we actually can't do something, there's no more. Don't want to opportunities are taken all the time now, because if you don't, somebody else will. Uh, and that, that, that kind of mentality came when I had a little baby. So yeah. how was that transition uh, in your work life and personal making that balance happen when you had the kids? The kids were big. So like marriage was easy because we've known each other for 13 going on 14 years now. Um, and when we got married, she just jumped on the bus. She came to every show. Um, and we, so we spent our days together, ch checked out like new cities together. And then she'd be side stage for every show. And we, you know, sleep in the same bed and show up in the next city together. That part was easy with kiddos. Um, we don't really know yet because COVID hit right after we had our first daughter and she had, that was her, literally the first weekend we had taken her on the road. And then, and then I went to Europe and COVID hit and I came home and we stopped touring. So she did one weekend and you know, she was young. So like mm -hmm. less than a year we were figuring it out and then we haven't done it since. So, uh, I think it, you know, 
without mentioning like how COVID kind of messed things up for that, it wouldn't make sense, but like they're not touring with me right now. So the way that we're most affected right now is I leave for three to four days a week and I don't see them. Um, whereas had we not had that little hiccup with touring and the whole thing, um, we were pro- probably would have integrated both babies into the, the bus life and the road life sooner. Um, but we're just kind of being careful right now. Um, I don't, I don't claim to know anything. I just don't like not knowing. So we're just trying to be safe about it. So that's the biggest thing is just what would have been them always being with me is right now me leaving for half the week every week, which is, it's rough. It's not, it's not the best. FaceTime's nice though. Yeah. Yeah. FaceTime's great. Yeah. It makes a big difference in uh, keeping that relationship consistent. Um, Has it changed the way that you write music? Having, having daughters? Yeah. I'm, uh, I know your song lady right yeah so i wrote that song from my first daughter presley before she was born and um and then i wrote another song which is the title track off that album called weekends look a little different these days <laughs> um realization i had uh sitting holding presley while she was drinking a bottle and i was watching saturday morning football and i was like i used to be the one holding a bottle and like at a bar, not on my couch with a daughter. And she had little gloves on her hands. So her fingernails wouldn't scratch her face and the whole thing. And I was like, life changed, you know? So I wrote that song. Now I got these two songs and I, I went to write the rest of the record. And I was like, yeah, you're bordering on writing a lullaby record at this point. You got to write the other songs too. And so the challenge became, I had always written about what I was going through in my life because that feels the most real and authentic. And I feel like also my, obligation to fans is to continue to pull back the curtain a little bit more and show them more of who I am day to day. But had I really been that specific and black and white about it, I would have just kept writing family songs, but there are people out there going through breakups and people falling in love. And I had to write those songs too. And so that was challenging because for the first time I had to write those songs, even though I wasn't doing that, I wasn't finding a first love. I was happily married. I was having babies, so there's no breakups in my future, you know? So writing the songs that weren't actually happening in my life at that moment, um, that was challenging, but it was fun. I enjoyed it. That was how I spent COVID basically is writing songs outside of my current scope, um, which I hadn't had to do before. It was, it was challenging, but it was, it was really fun. Yeah. How would you describe the, um, that Caliville style? Is that from spending, you know, growing up in California and spending time in the South or? I don't really know how it happened, but growing up in Southern California, I didn't move. I've been in Nashville for, I've been in Nashville for, it was just nine years in February. So, you know, I lived 32 years in Southern California. My whole life, people asked me where my accent was from. I'm like, I don't know, the beach? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so there was always this thing. I was even the one that found country music before my friends. When like Blink-182 and Offspring and all those bands were hitting, I found Tim McGraw and was listening to Don't Take the Girl. You know, I didn't like it and I have nothing against it, but like punk would never worked for me ever. So I was like the guy that got made fun of for listening to country music on the beach while they were all surfing and I wasn't surfing. I was like, had brought a ball and a glove or a football and I was like playing catch on the beach, you know? So I was always a little bit different, but I never understood also why I had an accent in people's minds you know I, i'm still told that i do i don't whatever my, right. me and my parents are born and raised in southern california too so yeah, that's yeah. the same thing has happened to me and i don't know where it is but every now and again like i constantly work on you know because of acting working on my speech um but every now and again i get that all the time is like where what what, what state are you from where are you from i'm like california what are you, i yeah. grew up on a beach like what are you yeah what are you talking about what are you hearing that i'm not hearing yeah, yeah. yeah um but i think that was a big part of it i think it was you know Growing up in California, but also having the, the R&B, like heavy R&B influence growing up. My parents' song was uh, the most blue-eyed soul dude ever. BJ Thomas, Hooked on a Feeling, was their song. Mm. But like I said, it was like Otis Redding and Sam Cooke and um, uh, uh, Gary Puckett and the Union Gap and stuff like that. Like that's what that they played in the house. So it's California plus soul plus I find country music like in the early nineties and something happened like organically where I just kind of had an accent my whole life. I don't know. 
Um, and so I moved to Nashville and the thing that never worked in 10 years in LA, bars, restaurants, four or five nights a week, never got one meeting with an executive. And then I moved to Nashville. I got a record deal inside of a year. Wow. And so that Caliville thing, I just had to, honestly, that word was just because I had to change the name of my publishing company. Because when you sign a publishing deal, they can't join with your publishing company. They have to join with you. So you have to come up with a new publishing name because that publishing had already existed. It's a long story, but I just thought California, Nashville, Caliville. And when I did that, it turned into a clothing line and the whole thing. And then people started just talking about it as like my sound. And it is, I mean, it honestly is the blend of growing up in Southern California, listening to soul music and then moving and, and doing country music. I, yeah. I just think it, that's organically what happened and, and California and Nashville came together to make a cool name is really all that is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it sounds like what a combination too. like you just said organic and Brock mentioned like being true to yourself. Like, you know, I feel like those things tend to just happen when you're doing you and yeah. just being yourself and growing and experiencing that. That's really cool. You said you've been uh, chasing it over 10 years at that point, you know, doing bars and everything like that. What was it like when you got the first hit? Massive hit. It was weird. Um, when I moved to Nashville, I had, I was 32 and I had kind of chalked it up to like, okay. Cause you know, in LA, the kids that are, are making it are kids. They're like 19 years old, yeah. sleeping on somebody's couch, you know? And so I'm like, I'm 32. Was Jimmy Ivey going to walk in and sign me to Interscope right now? Like, that's just not what's going to happen for me. I'm not going to be the, like the face of a boy band. Um, but those are the people I was like hanging around in LA, even though that's not the gigs I was playing. Those are, that's like, that was like my friend group. I had nothing against it. I was just like, I, this is, so I went to, to Nashville to, to write for other people. And I had to sing the demos. You write a song, you mm -hmm. want to pitch it. And if you're the better singer in the room, for better or for worse, you're singing on the demo. And so long story short, that whole thing happened. And now I'm back to the artist thing. And, and it was a whirlwind. And it was almost like what just happened. And before I knew it, the record deal and then the first single came out like faster than most people get signed and put a single out. So I wasn't... so. This is, this is to answer your question, we, the, the week that my first single Sleep Without You came out, we booked two shows that week, West Coast, Vegas at the Chelsea Theater at Cosmo, opening for Ban Perry, who was still huge at the time. And then the next day was my first stagecoach gig and it was main stage. Yeah. So I went Jeez. boom, boom. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm driving, my parents still lived in Orange County at the time. So then the next morning, I'm driving uh, from Stagecoach that I've just played. It was the noon spot, but who cares? It was main stage yeah. oh, so yeah. on the opening day, Friday, that weekend. And uh, I'm driving to see my parents and the local station there is K Palm. And we're like 20 minutes into our drive and it comes on. I remember the realization was like, all, all these people around me, they know, like they're here for Stagecoach. Everybody on the freeway and these cars around me are country fans. And they don't, they're listening to this right now and they don't even know it's me right here. That's a really cool feeling. And so it was like, it was just like a real, it, it was, it's, people say, what was the, like, the you made it feeling? And, you know, we have, we've had so many things happen since then, but that was the first one I had where I was like, what? Nobody even told me this was, this is accidentally playing in my rental car right now. This is incredible. <laughs> Um, so uh, that, I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was extremely validating, I guess, is the, the long way to give that answer. Brock actually got me into stagecoach, I'd say five, six years ago. And cause we'd be going out for Coachella and I'm, and you know, I went with Brock one year and we had so much fun. Now it's not even close with Coachella. It's our favorite thing to do by far. And like the, you know, the talent there, the spectacle, I mean, it's just such a, amazing gathering of people and they're literally all there like you said to hear good country music and enjoy themselves and have a good time and you you know the passion is real for sure so that's that's really cool some of them are getting over a breakup some of them have kids some of them, yeah you know, they're all there for the music yeah. right like i said you need yeah. a little you need a song for everybody yeah. you can't just write one type of song down the middle yeah everybody needs something you know everybody wants to be that's what people want from music is they want to feel like they're not alone in whatever they're going through they they want to feel known and uh 
and yeah, and that's that. You know, you don't get that from all genres. You really don't. And yeah. country music does that. Yeah, it's pretty special. Absolutely. I, and I, I love. I've loved country music since I was a kid. Uh, my mom used to listen to it all the time, and I didn't. I didn't like it because she liked it until one day I like I heard a, you know a Tim McGraw song, same kind of story, and I was like, holy crap, this is amazing! Like it makes you feel, you know, and, and, uh, I was one of the few people in Orange County that at the time liked country music, got made of fun of, uh, for liking country music. And now it's like, like Will saying too, it's, you know, uh, it's expanded and grown so much. And, and there's so many more fans, I think, than there's ever been before uh, yeah, in this space. In California, especially too. And like, my mom's from Dallas. So I definitely, you know, grew up with country as well. We we're slightly more on the rock and roll side, but obviously there's like a, a beautiful blend of both, right? Um, but yeah, no, I think clearly growing in California, I think stagecoach is a big part of that too. Yeah. It is. I told myself I would never attend until I could play there. And I never went with my <laughs> friends ever one time. That's awesome. So that that trip was the first time I ever set foot on the on the polo grounds. Hell yeah. That's cool, man. Uh, with your music video, um, you didn't, and you brought your wife in. Uh, how was that? It was awesome. We, um, so I guess to date right now, my first ever music video was with my wife. Oh, wow. And my most recent was with my wife. Um, we obviously, she was in the lady vis- video too, but that was because, uh, during COVID we couldn't bring a crew or anybody mm-hmm. in. And it actually turned out to be the most special home video that we'll ever have. But, um, I decided um, after my wife and I got back together that we had just gotten back together and we, I did the video for mercy, one of my songs and we cast a girl in it and, um, acting with another female just didn't feel right. And so I decided from that point on that, uh, it would either be hiring a male and female actor and actress while I do the performance part, or if you need me to do the performance part, it needs to be my wife. And, uh, you know, to, you know, if I was an actor, I could justify going, babe, it's part of the role, you know, <laughs> but I'm not, I'm a musician. Yeah. That would be a BS excuse to like do something that made her uncomfortable when it's not necessary at all, you know? So, uh, it was fun. It was, but she's a better actress than I am actor, hands down. And I have to do this stuff way more. So um, it was fun. We got to spend the whole day together and she looks dynamite on camera. And, um, and, uh, and that, that, will, that will be the case for the rest of my career. Is it's either hire both parts or it's going to be my wife. Yeah. So Rolling Stone has dubbed you one of country's most consistent radio stars. What do you think is it about your music that's so you know, broadly appealing? <laughs> if if I only knew, um, I think I think the the thing that has kept us consistent is is what we talked about before. I think authenticity and honesty honesty in the songs. Um, I think asking somebody to invest in you is asking somebody in, to invest in your life, um, and so if you're not putting any of yourself into the songs that you're putting out. Uh, how how are they expected to feel invested? You know, otherwise they're they're being invested in songwriters that wrote it for you that they don't know their name and they don't know anything about. And there's a there's a market for that too. But I think staying consistent with people is staying honest with people. And uh, I've always tried to. I said earlier, like kind of pull back the curtain a little bit more every time. You don't get to see everything. Privacy is really important. But um, that whole feeling known and feeling like you're not the only one thing comes from being honest and vulnerable with your fans when you write the songs. And I think that um, everything that I've heard back has been people saying like, oh, I'm, that's exactly where I am right now. Or I feel that, or I'm going through that right now. Or uh, I think that's how you keep them by going like, it's not just you, everybody, everybody goes through that stuff, you know? And so um, I hope that's what it is. Um, I'll, I'll I'll go back and mention Gavin DeGraw one more time just because he's been so uh, instrumental in my career. But he basically, how did he put it? He said, um, oh, I don't want to mess up, quote him and then mess up his words. Um, He said, as you go through your career, um, you have to continually change enough to gain new fans. 
but not so much that you lose the people that have been there from the beginning. Uh, and I, that's, I've, I think that's close enough that he wouldn't be bummed at the translation, but, um, I've always tried to do that. Like, here's a little something that you haven't really heard from me before, but it's not, I'm not abandoning the Brett Young that you met with the first record. Um, and so it's, I think that's it. I think it's staying consistent, staying honest, staying vulnerable. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I think people appreciate that. Do you, uh, do you have a favorite song of yours? If you're going to choose one. Yeah. I mean, the, the same reason that I'm just still terrified to write my second daughter a song is because I don't know that there's, there's a way to top lady. Um, I had that title forever. Uh, and then we figured out how to write it. When we figured out how to write it, it's like, <laughs> selfish, it's double dipping. It's really a song. It's a letter to my daughter, but it's really a love story about my wife all in one song. Mm -hmm. So I got immediate credit for my wife when I wrote <laughs> it. And then I was like, don't worry, Presley, when you grow up, you, I'll get credit from you too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and also all of it was true. All of it was like, exactly it was like my heart pouring out on a page and so uh i have to write one for my second daughter i don't <laughs> i'm terrified i don't know what that's even going to be but i don't know you know we just found out that my second single that i ever put out is called in case you didn't know and it's we just found out it's eight times platinum which is crazy Gee. um yeah. and it's so it's weird to say that lady is my favorite but yeah. i think it's the most personal and the most special to me that's what, what about uh i mean like I said, big fan of your music, so it's all of them are killers, man. You you do a great job, man. So it's awesome. Thank you. Um, um, what about performing? Is there a, a certain song or or even place that you like performing the best? Yeah, I think going home. I think I think playing Southern California is still my favorite. Um, I I was always told that that was the hardest place to sell tickets. Everybody, there's so much going on. Everybody's kind of jaded. I had one person. I won't, I won't name her name, but a close friend of mine. Um, if you guys know the hotel cafe. Oh yeah. 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 Um, in Hollywood, that was my favorite. I would, I would play there all the time and it's, you know, you can only do like a hundred people it's small. Uh, but it was always known for like, no matter who's there, it's always going to be good. Just go, who cares? Like a $10 ticket, whatever. And when I first got started, I couldn't believe that they were going to let me play there. But I was like, I can't be the guy that doesn't have all hundred people in here. Like, it's always full. So I was promoting really, really hard. And one of my closest friends, a girlfriend of mine, drove up from Orange County and then didn't show up at the show. And after the show, I, I called her and I was like, what happened to you? And she was like, I don't want you to be mad at me. Because I was like the early, I was like the 7 p.m. I was like the first guy on. And she goes, I don't want you to be mad at me. But I was at the coffee bean and Denzel Washington was in there and I couldn't let myself leave. And I was like, you just sat and looked at him. Yeah. I didn't even talk to him. Oh no. I was like, what, no. what is going on? And then I, but then it clicked like that's LA in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. There's that, that can happen all day, every day. You don't know where you're going to go and see somebody be starstruck or whatever it is. People are not just singing but they're acting and modeling and they're doing all so my the advice i was given or at least what i was like um cautioned against is that it's hard to sell tickets in la yeah we went back for my birthday a couple of years ago right before covid and we we played novo at uh right next to staples center yep and it's like 2700 tickets and it sold out in a day so we booked that was on friday so we booked the saturday it sold out in a day so we booked the sunday it sold out in a day and we did three nights back to back, sold it out. And I went, I feel like the hometown kid here. Like people show love here and that feels really good to come home. So there are, every city in America has been good to us, but that, that going home and feeling like accepted and supported at home feels really good. Yeah. I, I ironically just had that happen probably two weeks ago. I grew up in Orange County, right? And I left to go pursue a dream of acting and booked a role recently and shot it two weeks ago uh, in Newport. 
and I was like, this, I left here to do this and now it's bringing me back here. That's awesome. It's a crazy feeling, man. Yeah, yeah. It's it, amazing. Don't you just feel like totally validated in uh-huh. the decisions you made? It's the best thing. A hundred percent, you know? Yeah. And in growing up in Orange County too, there were uh, I, I had so many friends there, but also there's a lot of people, a lot of like animosity, a lot of hate, a lot of, you know, mm-hmm. people talking about each other and all that. And uh, I remember the first thing I ever did, music video. Uh, I had nothing in the bank account, nothing in my my IMDb role, no, none of that. And I do this music video, and the music video took off, uh, did really well. Uh, I don't think the band exists anymore, but um, they played it on MTV in every gym across the U.S. for like a year straight. It was like every <laughs> third video was that one, right? And so I'm like going out there, and all the people that used to talk uh, would have to go to the gym every day and see me up there. I'm like. Yes, you know, yeah. like it feels good. You know, it, it ta- and it speaks for you. You don't even have to say it's, anything. Exactly, You're like silence yeah. is king right there. Absolutely, <laughs> man. Yeah, I just keep my head down, yeah. keep working, man. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of fun. There's a film called Game Night where you know one of the wives. This is like a total side thing. Jason but, Bateman, I love that movie. Yeah. 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 So one of the wives like thinks she had an affair with Denzel, but it's like a guy that <laughs> said he was Denzel. So funny. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> yeah. The husband had to be like, that's not, are you kidding? Did he ever say he was, <laughs> did, did you, a, that was probably the guy at the coffee shop Yeah, <laughs> that she sat and looked at and skipped my show for. <laughs> oh man, if she didn't have a photo, man, it's a big chance, man, big chance. That's like, I couldn't stop thinking about that. Sorry, when you said that. <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah. Oh, it's so great. Yeah, man. What do you, what do you have coming up? You gotta, we're busy again, um, which feels good. Um, uh, the summer is generally fairs and festivals um, that just kind of eats up the whole summer. Um, lots of casino shows, yeah, which are pretty fun. Uh, that's that audience is built in. Yeah. They basically all need a break from gambling because they've lost too much money, so they're going to come <laughs> yeah. catch a show for a minute. But um, that's that'll be most of the summer, and then in the fall we'll we'll go out on like a sanction tour, and I'll have an opener and the whole thing. We're kind of routing that right now. Um, I'm going in November. I'm going uh, back to Europe. And we're doing, uh, I think, three weekends, any, anywhere from Stockholm to Oslo to the UK. And uh, I think we finish in London, um, which is the first time we've headlined over there. We always go over for that uh, C2C festival. And we play the arenas. And we just did that with Open for Darius Rucker on this last trip. Uh, and we do so well over there. We just decided to check it out. And it's already sold out. So we're... Congrats. That's going to yeah. be fun. Thank you. In November, I'm going to I'm gonna get us a... a a babysitter for enough days for wifey to come over and, and experience some of that with me. And, um, and, uh, we, you know, we, that the record that I have out now, I have to, uh, I don't have a follow-up single, so I'm going to have to get in and, and record the back half of that record. We did a, a collection, which is like an EP, mm. just an extended EP, um, which is what EP actually means, but I don't know why. Um, we got to do like six or seven more songs and have some singles ready for the follow-up. So we'll get in the studio here soon. I got like 300 songs that I've written over COVID that it's wow. not going to be hard to pick from, but we have to pick them. So um, we're busy and, and my girls are young and, and, and they uh, require and, and deserve a lot of attention. So um, just kind of like, you know, nose to the grindstone, just trying to make sure that, like I said before, nobody's out working and, uh, and, and, and nobody's getting opportunities because we passed on them or weren't ready for them. How, how long uh, does it take? I, I know you said like earlier, sometimes it works right away, uh, but from beginning or trying to create a song to conception, how long would you say it usually takes to make a, any, any one song really? Was the that? writing side of it um, in Nashville, hmm. if you don't have something in four hours, you don't have something. Um, we generally get in Nashville, we'll get the demo back the same day. Like I wrote this morning, I expect to listen to it before I go to bed tonight. Wow. I sang the vocal, um, either, the, either the, the producer writer in the room will sing the background vocal after I leave. Or one of the writers is that t- today, both of, I don't even know who they're going to choose today. Both of the other two writers are incredible singers as well. So, um, the Nashville method is really like 11 to three. And then listen to the song before you go to bed, which is crazy because in LA you 50, 50 chance. They're going to cancel the right altogether the morning of, Damn. but that if you guys know LA, that doesn't really surprise you. No, uh, I they, didn't. they write at night. They book a studio instead of doing it at a house. Uh, they write through the night. They cater food. 
they might need two sessions. So we're like, we're pretty much here in town. We expect a song in four hours um, and a demo that night. That's, you know, and then, like I said, there's 300 of those that I'm sitting on trying to pick seven songs from. So the next, the next station is you pick those songs, you go to your producer, minus Dan Huff, who's a genius. He's incredible. Um, and you book an actual studio in town with live musicians. Um, don't, you don't do it in the box anymore. We may do some in the box this time just because we feel like we got our finger on the pulse of some cool things that can be programmed. But for the most part, we'll go to Blackbird or somewhere here in town and we'll knock out three a day with a band. Yeah. Um, and so the, you know, the time frame is, is really four hours to write it. Um, and then if you pick it to put it on a record, by the time you have tracked it in the studio, you can probably have a master inside of a month, like ready to wow. go out. That's uh, like recorded, overdubbed, like adding guitars and background vocals, getting it mixed, maybe remixed if there are notes, and then send it to master inside of a month. Yeah. It's, wow. It's, it, moves, it can move fast. It can move really slow too if you don't have the budget for it. So yeah. I guess that it's kind of a fluid uh, answer, but it, for us, it's like write a song in four hours. And from tracking it to getting the master is like a month. Amazing. Because of COVID and everyone had really no uh, other options except for to sit at home and write. Do you think in the next coming years, we're going to see some of the best country songs and music that maybe there's ever been, uh, or maybe just a massive influx altogether? I don't know. Um, I, I went from thinking that zoom was saving everything to like three weeks later thinking that it was, totally dumbing down the process because there's an energy in the room that you lose. Um, it's possible because people were probably writing more, but if all of those rights are being affected by that, then they might all be a bunch of throwaways. And I don't know, wow. I got some good ones, but it was way more difficult for me creatively. Oh, interesting. Yeah. 300 songs. That's a ton. I, I feel like your fans will be stoked to hear that. Though. <laughs> <laughs> They'll hear like five of them, but yeah. <laughs> Um, hell yeah. Well, you know, how do you feel about the Troubadour golf club here in Nashville and you know, how does it compare to some other discovery land courses? I mean, discovery land does it the best. Um, specifically for me, this was my first experience with discovery land. So we've been, we've been, uh, members for about three years now. Um, and in those three years I've gotten to experience a bunch of other courses as well. Um, uh, the experience, it, it's not, people just think, oh, it's another golf community. It's not the kind of all encompassing thing. Um, especially with a young family, especially with a young family for us has been a game changer. We don't, you know, we're 45 minutes outside of town and we never feel like we have to leave here. Um, and I think, you know, for us, that's been our neighbors kids are my kids friends and they're going to go to the same school and we're i'm going off to barbecue for you know neighbors and their kids right you know right now in a few minutes um the the sense of community um but also like the things that are avail available to you from from fitness to golf to outdoor pursuits to all that stuff that's stuff that you would be a, a like a a full day outing for any one of those things and it's just all here um, and so we feel so safe and taken care of, um, and you know, our, our kids feel like they're, we feel like they're being active within our convenience, which is such a selfish thing to say, but it's true. It's so easy. It's so fun. Um, and I think that it's, I think it's being done better than anybody else is doing it, uh, within the market. And so we, I, my wife knew about it. I'm thankful to her every day for bringing me out here to look at uh, the house that we live in now. Uh, because I think the model is perfect. That's great to hear. You, you know, you always want to hear people are, are happy and with their families and doing what they want with their families and making those memories, right? That's what it's about. I even took up golfing. I'm terrible at it, and I still <laughs> like it here. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> That's incredible. Well, man, thanks for coming in, and uh, you got a barbecue to catch, so uh, <laughs> let's get you out of here. Let's just make sure I don't undercook the chicken. <laughs> Thank <laughs> Thanks, you, you guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, bro. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to drop a like if you enjoyed the video. And subscribe and hit the bell for a whole lot more to come.
Thanks for tuning in to Studio 22.